Hey folks, got my hair, got mine, at your services. How are you all? I think we're doing well. It's not a whiskey, is it? No, it's Guinness. And I know people out there are going, but you should pour that slowly into a glass. That's how you're meant to drink it. Of course, but that's why we have pubs. Hmm, that's why we had pubs. <laughs> bring them back, please, bring them back. Anyway, cheers, y'all. Now, although this film I'm about to discuss now is not exactly Christmassy, it is very contemporary and current because it's about diseases being spread. <laughs> it's about the environment. It's about crushing ministerial authority coming in and changing the rules and doing all sorts of stuff. It is from the early 70s, 1973, I think. Doom Watch! Yeah. Now, I received this yesterday of my good friend Astrodyne, who also sent me this t-shirt as well. So, loving your work. Um, now, this is a film based on what was already a TV series, which was like an eco ecological sort of thriller. Week by week, this team, who were called Doomwatch, would encounter a new eco-catastrophe, usually sort of brought about by ministerial um, misbehaviour, or horrible capitalists dumping stuff here, there and everywhere and uh, a regular team and it was popular enough I believe although I don't remember it but then they made an offshoot movie which was just called Doomwatch and it was for Tygon Pictures directed by Hungarian born Peter Sazdy Peter Sazdy had done a couple of Hammer movies forgettably tasted a lot of Dracula <coughs> don't bother, it doesn't taste that good and, uh, but very interesting, Hands of the Ripper, which is a great take on the Jack the Ripper mythology, and one of the early 70s Hammer movies where they tried to break new ground. A lot of it failed, but some of it was really good and should have been recognised at the time, but sadly wasn't. But he would then go on to do a lot of TV shows, uh, a lot of thrillers and stuff, and he would do the unusual movie, Welcome to Blood City, in 1977, with Jack Palance, which was unusual. It was a UK-Canadian co-production, and it was clearly um, a rip-off inspired by Michael Crichton's Westworld. And interesting concept, but very, very badly done. And I'm afraid it's Peter Sazdy who was at fault for that. His direction was lumpen and all over the show. And his direction here, because this, Doomwatch was a successful TV show, and he wanted to make a movie out of it, but he wanted to try to keep the same flavour as the TV show, an ecological disaster, the team would go out and investigate, but we'd have big stars in this one, of a bigger budget, although still very small, and it'd be like a feature length sort of movie, and the idea was that it'd be successful and we'll get out do much too, maybe three, the film wasn't successful at all, but it's garnered something of a, a bit of a cult following, because I think it's themes, it's, it's old style British filmmaking, it's rural locations, because the whole thing is set on this little island, this little Cornish island, just off the coast of which an oil tanker has gone down. Although you don't see any of that. This is the synopsis, this is the premise of the story, and it could be polluting, you know, the water. So, Doomwatch, you know, our troubleshooting crew of eco-warriors, led by Greta Thunberg. More on her later. But where is she these days? It's gone very quiet without her. Have they, have they locked her down in some, in, in a, within a lockdown, within another lockdown, and just locked her down within that even further? Because she's very, very quiet about all this, isn't she? You'd think this COVID would be something that she'd be all, you know, well, I warned you, this would happen. <laughs> Planes in the sky, transferring viruses and diseases. Anyway, so they send Ian Bannon, great Ian Bannon, shouty-mouthed Ian Bannon, to go and investigate and he's meant to be there for just a day and the idea is just take some algae samples get some fish if you can get some mollusks check the water get your little box your little glass jars put some samples and bring them back but the minute he sets foot on this island well you know the score outsiders setting foot in like a rural enclave be it in the countryside in the outback in the woods or an island yeah, never made very welcome, are you? No. And don't go thinking that's just like some kind of movie cliche. Because it's true! 
I've encountered this many times. I'm sure you all have. If you're an outsider, then you don't belong. That pub, like the slaughtered lamb, you walk in. Hey, everybody, hey, nice to be here. And every head just turns. Uh-oh, the music goes off. You know, the ale stops pouring. <laughs> Time completely freezes. Okay. <laughs> I'll just dance my way out of here then. I'll win you all over by the end of the night. You know that. So Ian Bannon arrives there and he gets a very frosty welcome. He struggles to find somewhere to stay. He's only there for a night. But he ends up seeing uh, the local constabulary, which is Percy Herbert, the great Percy Herbert, who's been in so many sci-fi and genre movies, action movies, carry-on movies. He's been in everything. And he, look, he looks a hell of a lot older in this film than he did like, only just a couple of years prior. But anyway, he gets somewhere to stay. He notices that somebody is following him wherever he goes. He goes around the coast, he goes around the rocky coves, he steals some bird's eggs, you know, he's going to do a big, massive psychological environmental test on all of these specimens back at the lab. And uh, there's someone with a gun is following him. But they're not shooting at him, they're clearly just observing him. So he takes his stuff back there and they analyse all this. But what really sort of piqued his interest was the fact that not only is the luscious Ju Judy Geeson, yeah, Judy Geeson, oh, great stylist for the 70s and 80s, oh yes, very, very attractive. Girl next door look, but beautiful at the same time. The poor girl that was Im impregnated by an alien in the film, in Seminoid. <laughs> yeah. I'll cover that one day. And um, he's encountered her, and she's, she's an outsider too, but she's been there for two years, and only, only after two years she's begun to get to know the people. They've begun to accept her. And she's the school teacher. But it's a very close-knit community. But he's observed that there's something strange going on as well. Uh, you know, tell us something we, we couldn't have guessed already. And he's seen people in the night, someone staggering around the street who's being manhandled. No, get him back, get him back. What's going on there? What's happening? Anyway, all this stuff gets analysed. And look, I think you need to go back there because there's something very strange taking place, his bosses say. So off he goes back there, where he will encounter yet more frostiness. But he's also going to encounter in the barn, someone who's been locked away in the barn, who's been getting fed and looked after. But when he goes in to investigate, this figure looms out of nowhere with a big, sort of misshapen fod, big heavy brows, a broad nose, face totally misshapen, who clumps him unconscious. When he wakes up the next day, everyone's, oh, what, what, what you mean? Uh, I don't know. Well, I, you were proud, proud you in the bar, you know, I don't know what you do, you just knocked your head. But yeah, you've guessed it. There isn't just an oil tanker that's spilled its load offshore, because you, you actually... Forget about all that. That's had no bearing on this at all. It's something else. Something else under the sea. Yeah. And it's causing... Because it, it's there's canisters that have been dumped in a little rocky cove around the bay, which has been netted off. Well, not. it's been roped off with boys saying, military defence, prohibited area, keep out. And the great James Cosmo, James Cosmo, yeah, from Highlander, from Braveheart, from Troy, from Game of Thrones. He's awesome. He's very young in this. He's, the, he's a local fisherman. And he takes, you know, Ian Bannon and Judy Geese and will go out there and they'll encounter us. Well, why is it prohibited? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but the Navy dumped stuff there years ago. The Navy, you say? Right. Okay, well, look into this then. And um, But deep down there, there's canisters which the Navy didn't put down there. Some other company put down there but we'll come on to that in a bit but these canisters are leaking and it's getting into the, the water and the fish are getting polluted and they're catching the fish and you see some of the fish are like shouldn't shouldn't this be about that big and it's about that fucking big you know and like, wow well, who eats all this fish do you, do, you, do you take it to the mainland oh no it's mainly the islanders who eat it it's too good for the mainlanders right hmm okay then so they analyse all this stuff, and what it's doing is causing um, acromegaly, acromeglia, something like that, which is giantism and deformities. It's a real thing, and it's, it affects the pituitary gland, so it just secretes even more of this hormone into the body, making you very misshapen. It's been seen in movies quite a lot, um, 
in the film Tarantula, Edward, Edward G. Carroll, uh, who creates the giant Tarantula, he ends up with acromegaly as well, and he ends up all, it's, it's a great makeup effect on him as well, and his lips are all over the show, like, and his one eye's up there, one eye's down there, and it, oh, it is quite hideous. He's even scarier than the Tarantula, and he's a good guy. But, um, and, oh, I forgot the guy's name, but there was a, a great B-movie fella, uh, actor, who was, oh, I, it's a shame I've forgotten his name now, because he, in real life, suffered from the same disease, so obviously it gave him, well, a shortened lifespan, but it also gave him a lot of unique roles playing bad guys, henchmen, monsters, and most celebratedly, the Creeper in the film, The Creeper. And I just can't remember his name. Rondo Hatton. Rondo Hatton. I knew it'd come to me. And he had the, the real life disease. So they've worked out like that the island is not overrun with monsters, if that's what you're thinking. But all the local people are keeping, if they've got someone in their family who's got this disease, because obviously it affects people quicker than other people or more drastically than other people, they begin to lock them away in rooms and feed them. But they don't want outside help. They think because the priest on the island is one of those wrath and thunder, you know, Bible thumpers. You know, it's, it's God's will. It, it's, it's years of inbreeding that's caused this. This is what he's saying. This is what they all believe. It's years of inbreeding and it's God's will that's, that's caused all this. Now, for the filth you got up to, look at you all now. So Ian Bannon's got his work cut out for him trying to convince these people. But the film, half the film is structured like a mystery. So you've got Ian Bannon mostly, you know, traipsing about the island, encountering weird people, seeing more deformities, trying to work it all out. And then once they have worked it out, it's back on the mainland, back in the, the, the Doom Watch central office, where they all go, choo, 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 and they've got a big, one of those big maps on the wall, and they're putting little pins in. There's, mm, it's been spotted here as well. And they work out, because they go and see, look, the MOD and the Navy have been involved in this. So they go and see George Sanders, not Colonel Sanders, but Naval, a Naval Admiral Sanders, who's now riding a desk. And George Sanders is great, but he's not particularly great in this. It's a very sort of washed up sort of role. You only see him sitting behind a desk. And first of all, Ian Bannon's like kind of accusing him, you know, you dump it, you've been dumping stuff there. No, 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 no. Oh, if we did, it was radioactive waste. Oh, that's okay then. And that genuinely is the, the tack that they take with it. Oh, it's just um, radioactive waste. Well, that's all right. That we, we won't worry about that. That, that doesn't that doesn't concern us. In any other movie, that'd be creating Godzilla. It'd be creating Gorgo, King Kong, whatever. Giant squid-faced Cthulhu monsters coming ashore and raping all the women and abducting the men or raping all the men and abducting... Well, doing whatever fish men do. And... But that's just washed away. Oh, forget about that. It's these other canisters. And they've been back. James Cosmo has took them back with a photographer who's gone underwater. Some, some nice underwater photography. And he's photographed these other strange canisters which have all got weird serial numbers on. And they keep popping and bubbles coming up. Obviously you know, corrupting and you know, tainting the water around it. And obviously the wildlife there too. Getting into the food chain. So they show these pictures to uh, George Sanders. And he goes, wait a minute, we didn't put those there. <laughs> Isn't that one of the great tricks of all time? Like, you know, like, look, we've got pictures of these canisters. We didn't put them there. That's nothing to do with us. And we've got these ones. That, well, we didn't put those ones there for certain. Ah, but you put the other ones there, though. Ah, ah, ah. One of them. Hook, line and sinker. But he goes, yeah, well, they've got a serial number on them. So surely you can work out where they come from. So they find this other company who've been chemicals and pituitary grand, grand, there's a thousand of them, pituitary gland hormone something, whatever they're trying to do. I think they're trying to make crops bigger, they're trying to make animals bigger, they're just trying to you know, increase you know, food output, one of those ideas. But when you mess with the ecology, you know, you mess with us too. So these come across it, but they discover it's not actually the company themselves, it's the people, when they realise they've made a mistake with the pituitary hormone going in there, that, oh shit, right, let's get rid of all this. But it's the company that took the stuff to be disposed of, just didn't care, and just dumped it there. But you get to meet all these deformed people who, the film mismarketed it. 
this idea as being like a monster movie, which it clearly is not. They are not monsters, they are just very unfortunate victims of a horrible disease. Um, uh, Ian Bannon is given orders to go back to the island again and try to convince the townsfolk that, look, this is a serious problem, but we can treat you. It's not years of inbreeding. <laughs> Although, no one seems to argue with that. We haven't been inbreeding, but they clearly have been. Like, Because, <laughs> again, it's like that, that switch and bait sort of trick again. Like, you know, they, No one's arguing with the inbreeding, but... <laughs> It's God's will, and uh, so you know he's trying to convince them all that look, we can fix this. I'm a doctor, you know. We can we can sort this out. It's just a disease. It's not inbreeding. It's not God's will. Even the the one who's been following him with the gun, he finds this guy, and it's 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 a lad whose father had instructed him to go following this guy because this stranger on their island just to keep an eye on him. Um, but his father's got the disease, and the son's got it too. And the son's got these big eyebrows out there. But he's only just begun to succumb to it. But his dad's obviously gone mad. And the, another effect of this, this pituitary hormone, is that you can go into murderous fits. Now you'd think that would be the horror movie side of it, but it doesn't really happen. They do go a bit crazy. Obviously one's clubbed Ian Bannon over the head. and uh, But you discover that this lad who's been following Ian Bannon says that my dad went crazy and he killed my sister in one of these fits of just rage and fury. And... Ian Bannon has found a body of a girl buried in the woods when two dogs have been trying to rip the ground up and get to the body. He's fought the dogs, the dogs attack him, he's fought them off, found the girl's body, gone to Percy Herbert, who's come back with a shovel, he's the cop I remember, and of course the body's been moved, oh, but it was there, so you've got all that, that's all in the first half of the film, where you're getting all this mystery elements, these eerie segments, which work really well. But then once you know what it is, the film is a it's a different film, and I think that second half would be more akin to most of each episode on the TV show. You might have at the start of the episode, you know, the mystery element. Someone has a uh, strange boil. Um, someone shooting laser beams from their eyes. Whatever, something strange is happening. You know, there's frogs falling from the sky. Whatever it is, and then they, they go in and investigate, and then most of the episode would be uncovering this and how how we're going to treat this, who's to blame, and how we're going to rectify this problem and the film takes that aspect as well that format first half mystery eerie possible monsters supernatural who knows who knows second half we know exactly what it is how we're going to deal with it and that's the procedural um template that it follows but it's 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 still interesting though and even though it's low budget and it, it's it's very dour and miserable and wet and ugh, you know it, it's not very exciting. It's still interesting enough to keep the attention. I like, it's a 90 minute movie. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I love seeing Judy Geeson anyway. Um, but I love Ian Bannon as well. Although Ian Bannon... <laughs> why the hell you'd send this guy to any island? Because Ian Bannon only has two styles. Um, shout! And shout louder! <laughs> so when he gets all the towns fucking and by now a lot of them, you can see a lot of them are deformed. So the people are bringing him out the woodwork sort of thing. The priest has warmed to him because his pre it, the priest's daughter was pregnant. And in a scene which you don't see, you, you just see the aftermath really. You discover that, uh, he, Doctor, I need you, you know, because, oh, you want my help now? You wouldn't help me the other day. No, I, I, need, I need your help now. And he, it's his daughter giving birth. But she, the child is stillborn and the child is clearly massively deformed. You see the girl unconscious, uh, he's just sedated her. But her eyebrows are up like that, and they look into the, the cot where the baby should be, and like the priest just goes, <gasps> and it's one of those great moments. Where you you want to kind of see it, and you're kind of happy that you don't. But uh, so the priest has now believed him. So the job is, and he's got this lad whose father had gone mad and all that, and uh, like so to try and convince him. Look, I've got this lad now. I know what's happening to you all. It's acromegalia. Uh, we can treat it. Doctors have known about it for years. Well. How are you going to treat us then? Are you going to treat us here on the island? Uh, no, you'll have to come to the mainland to hospitals. Well, how long for? Oh, I, I don't know. A week? Uh, I don't know. A month? A, a, a year? And he goes, well, possibly more like a year. So you didn't know about a week or a month, but you knew about a year. And they say, well, we're not leaving the island for a year. If we go from the island, the whole place will be destroyed. I'm not quite sure what they mean by that. Why would it be destroyed? Uh, it, a capitalist's going to come in and 
take all the, the island for its natural resources. They're going to put oil refineries on it. What are they going to do? Is the army going to take it over in a big missile installation? I don't know. I don't know what they're getting at there, but the islanders seem pretty pretty firm in their belief. It'll, de it'll destroy the island. We're not going. So Ian Bannon, instead of trying to placate them, ends up shouting all the more, Look, I'm a doctor! I've got this boy here, I can treat him, but not here, back on the island, back on the mainland, in hospitals. You've got to listen to me! And he's like, oh, fucking hell, are you meant to be on our side or what? But he is good though, he's got an intensity to him, and a very likeable curmudgeon face, Ian Bannon. He always looks like, he, in anything, he looks like he's on the verge of erupting into complete and utter hysteria, a real, argh, He's great as a school teacher or as a sergeant major or, you know, well, anything that just turns nasty. He's also in, uh, in Braveheart. James Cosmo, again, is in Braveheart. Mel Gibson's Braveheart. And he is the guy that Rob, he's Robert the Bruce's father. So, and he's, he's a leper, but he's fabulous in that as well. And uh, I love him. I love him. I think he's great. But the second half of the movie does feature a lot of uh, toing and throwing from offices and, you know, the, the Doom Watch setup. And there's a helicopter being used a couple of times. But it's only for, like, shots of landing and taking off. And it's got some... It's just... We've got, got a budget for a helicopter. But it's bringing in. Because Ian Bannon's character is going to be... We're going to send him off. Right, take the helicopter. You're flying up to see this chemical engineer. You've got to go and see the Admiral Colonel Sanders, whatever his name is. You know, you're going to do all that again. So you get lots of shots of the helicopter landing in the same place, taking off in the same place, Ian Bannon getting out and having a conversation with someone outside, and then getting back in the helicopter and going off again. Or worse yet, the most obvious yet, he gets out of the helicopter and has a conversation with his direct boss for about five minutes, as a, the rotors are going, woo, woo, woo. and then the two of them get on the helicopter and fly off. Why did he just? Why did the other guy just get on the helicopter and have the conversation? That, because you couldn't actually do any in-flight filming, I suppose. But anyway, but there, there is some great little touches to it. I do like the bit with uh, George Sanders as the, as the Admiral. And he's saying, like, because they've got the photographs there, obviously, of, of these canisters. He's going, but that's a prohibited area. We've got boys marking the whole place out. And like, Ian Bannon just goes, well, well, our photographer didn't see him because he was underwater. And you go, okay, you got me there, yeah. <laughs> He didn't know it's prohibited. He couldn't read it. They were up on the surface. Ah, oh, it's top stuff. Um, and it is kind of pertinent these days because we are definitely, despite the whole COVID pandemic hysteria and stuff, we've still got ecological problems. As you well know, during the first major lockdowns in many countries, nature returned. Pollution just seemed to go away. The canals of Venice were crystal clear. Marine life returned to them. That's just the tip of the iceberg, uh, because so much returned. Just here, birds, nature, everything. I have, I've been working from home all this year, and the back doors have been open to let Roxy the Wonder Dogs thunder in and out. But the amount of wildlife, it's been like a fucking Walt Disney movie. It's like Snow White, because we've had squirrels and badgers and all bloody sorts of things coming in. Foxes, everything's coming. They don't all sing like they do in Disney, though, but they've all been here. And now, of course, when we've returned back to, oh, lockdowns have been you know, eased up and that, and planes are back in the sky, pollution's returned. But that's always on the news. That's, that's the last thing they're going to talk about, because it's all pandemic. It's all COVID stuff. So this, I suppose, with man being on this planet, we're always going to have issues of the ecology and the environment, because we... It's in our nature to destroy. It's in our nature to pollute. We are. We do not pick up after ourselves. Wherever we go in the world, we destroy that environment. Nature, despite all of the worries and the scares, nature just reforms and does something else. But we, we should not be the ones responsible for making nature do that. Because we're going to turn this world into an absolute barren wasteland. We are. We are. And that, that is going to be probably a lot sooner than a lot of scientists have been saying. Anyway. So Greta Thunberg again, but she'd get on board with this movie, this Doomwatch group. And it's a great name, Doomwatch, because it really is not exactly positive, is it? That's not the most upbeat of names, but it's a cool name, though. No. We're on the watch, on the lookout for doom, and despair, and destruction, and danger. <laughs> so they are looking out for this sort of thing. Now, the crew back on the 
the Doom Watch head office. I, I'm not sure if they're in the original series. I've got a feeling that they are. You've got three, they've got the boss and another roving reporter type guy. And uh, this girl who does a lot of talking as well, does a few experiments, does some number crunching and all that kind of thing. Puts a lot of pins in the board. We found these canisters here, 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 and here. You know. And uh, I reckon those three are in the original TV show. Now, let's say the first half of the, the film does have some eerie, sort of pseudo horror moments. And you've, you've got like a, a Wicker Man, a Wrong Turn, a Hills of Eyes sort of feel. Strange in a Strange Land, deformities, aggression. Because this thing makes you aggressive as well. They inject two dogs, two puppies from the same litter. This is back at the uh, the Doom Watch lab. And one's just a little cute thing. Like, the other one's fucking huge. They go, oh, well, that's clearly where. And she goes, don't don't pet him. And the dog goes ballistic. It's only a puppy. And he goes, oh, yeah. That's a second dog that's attacked him in that film as well. And um, so <laughs> it clearly, he's, he's witnessed this. Like the, that guy that clubs him. And I think the lad's father, the lad with the big father and all that, eyebrows, who wants to work with him. Um, we've seen a guy go crazy and smash an upstairs window from the outside and then tumble out and his head's all before. Well, we learned that that was the lad's father. The one he killed, he actually killed his daughter, the lad's sister. So you do get a finale where um, after the failed town meeting, Ian Ballin and Judy Geeson go back to the, the guest house and they try to, on one of these phones, operator, get me London. Get me the Doom Watch headquarters. Uh, he's going to say, like, I'm going to have to order them to come in here and do something because the islanders just don't want uh, any outside help. And then next thing you know, they get surrounded by... It's a bit like um, the film Dead and Buried or even The Fog where all these deformed figures loom out in, in the darkness out the, outside the window. They smash the glass and they all come in and they surround them and they push a table over. And it obviously it looks aggressive, but the, it's just the fear of these people that they're going to get taken off the island. So... It's, but it's, it's more sympathetic and very haunting in a way. It's not, it's not scary, it's not horrible. It's, it's just the plight of these poor people. And the film does end with a very sort of sobering image um, of all the emergency services arriving on the island and little boats and flotillas taking all the, the people and the kids off. And Judy Geese, the teacher, saying, hey, look after the kids you know, and all that. Like, and I'll be in touch and all this. So they are all being evacuated off the island and they're going to be treated on the mainland. So happy ending sort of but these islanders are still convinced that the, the island will not be worth returning to so it's a sad bleak and yet kind of realistic ending there's no happy it, no instant cure there's no like oh it's going to jab you in the arm and everything's going to be great none of that bullshittery folks <laughs> so i like it i think it's good fun anyway folks time's up so 